All right, well, we made it through the holidays. Hopefully they were a joyful time for you. But there is something nice about just getting back into the regular routine and schedule of life. And um, I'm glad you're here on a Wednesday night to make that part of your routine of life. I think there's great benefit that comes each and every time we gather together as a body of Christ to, to read the word together, to pray, to fellowship, to share in communion, um, giving God a chance just to do something special in our life. So I'm very, I'm very glad that you're here. I'm glad to be here as well. I had a blessed uh, time the last couple of days studying for um, our next uh, installment here in Leviticus. We're going to be in Leviticus chapter 21. And try and make it to chapter 23, and then hopefully in our next study, next Wednesday night, we will um, finish up the book of Leviticus and, and keep on rolling. So let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord to speak to our hearts. Um, I, think, uh, I think as we read through this, um, this is what I want to pray for. We, we, here we are in 2023. Good job. Um, 2023, and we are, um, we're set apart still, but if we would pretend like we don't get impacted by the culture we live in, I think we're just naive. And um, it doesn't mean we become like them, but the impact is there, and, and to be aware of it is a really good thing. And so we, we develop these ideas And um, I think one of them that we're going to see is this idea and the importance of an individual that we hear of so much, the importance of an individual over and above everything else. I promise you, that was not the mentality in Leviticus 21. It wasn't even the, what was important was the, was the family. And what was important is the community that you were a part of. What was important was the worship of God. And I think as we read through these chapters tonight, we're going to find that our 2023 um, worldview is going to begin to creep up a little bit. Like, whoa, wait a minute. I don't know if that's, I, I don't know if I like that. And uh, I, what I would encourage you to do is, is to allow God to become large in your mind. Allow him to become preeminent in your mind. That there's nobody that's even close to him. And so therefore what he requires and what he asks of the nation of Israel and among the priests is completely appropriate. And if we find it difficult to receive, then you have to do what I did as I was thinking through this. Lord, I know you're right. I know you are loving and kind and true and you care for people. So Lord, help me to see what it is that was being communicated in, these, in this section. So, let's go ahead and, and begin with a word of prayer for that to be accomplished. Lord, we um, kneel before you. You are a holy God. You are transcendent. Lord, you are over and above everything. And um, yet you have come and you have redeemed us. And we just held, held the elements in our hand that reminds us of the great love you have for us and that you redeemed us, and we are grateful for it. But give us a heart and a mind to receive all that you have to say to us. And Lord, I put my name at the top of that list. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Chapter 21 in the book of Leviticus, we're going to see how the priests were set apart. And chapter 22, we're going to see... I'm just giving you a a single summary thought. There are other things that are going on in there. But in chapter 22, we're going to see that they were only to bring acceptable sacrifices to the Lord. God is the one who gets to determine what an acceptable sacrifice is. And in chapter 23, we're going to get a quick look at their calendar and the seven feasts that governed their nation, um, their, their national calendar. I'll put it that way. So in chapter 21... Uh, We're going to read of the limitations placed upon the priests that were privileged to serve. You might want to be thinking about this, to whom much is given, much is required. Uh, Teachers are going to be held in stricter judgment. These are some teachings from the New Testament that may help us to kind of orient ourselves as we go through. I think we should approach this section with the mentality that uh, God is the one that's preeminent. Not the individual. 
the priest and especially the high priest are representing a picture of Christ. And so some of the things we're going to read, this is what I would say is, is driving it. And there's, there's a powerful lesson in typologies. What's a typology? It's, we're reading about a scene in the Old Testament that is prefiguring, it's foreshadowing an aspect of the ministry or the nature of Jesus. And God guards that typology jealously. He guards it. May, maybe you'll remember what happened to Moses. The, Moses, when they were out of water in the wilderness, the first time he struck the rock and water came out. And if you will, the Lord said, good job, Moses. That was a good job. You were faithful. You did exactly what I said. They got thirsty again, and he struck the rock again. Was the Lord pleased? Was it that a boy? No. And he says, you, I didn't tell you to do that. You are not going to enter the promised land. Fast forward in the New Testament, and Paul teaches us that there was a rock that was following them through the wilderness, and that rock was Jesus. He was the Christ. He, he was the one, so when he was struck, and that opened up that flow of water that gave them living water, if you will, to live. When he struck him a second time, how many times is Jesus to be struck? How many times is he to go to the cross? Once. So when he struck it a second time, not only did he misrepresent the heart of God to the people, but he was messing with the typology that Jesus only suffers once. And so we see the way in which he deals with Moses in such serious uh, uh, correction. You don't get to go in the promised land. So allow these things to kind of set in our mind. Verses 1 through 4 of chapter 21 in the book of Leviticus. Let's focus upon the cons how they were to be consecrated, but they were to be consecrated even in grief. Even in grief, they were to be consecrated. And the Lord said to Moses, speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron. So this was not for everybody. So it wasn't for the tribe of Judah, Manasseh, Ephraim. And say to them, none shall defile himself for the dead among his people, except for his relatives who are nearest to him, his mother, his father, his son, and his daughter, and his brother. Also his virgin sister who is near to him, who has no husband, for her he may defile himself. So don't think of defile in the sense of like um, sin, but just if you're touching a, 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 somebody that's deceased, you would be unclean to come into the temple. Um, but for even his sister who has no husband, he could. Otherwise, he shall not defile himself, being a chief man among his people, to <clears throat> profane himself or make himself unclean. So this isn't sinful if he was to help out these that are listed, but there was a consecration. You couldn't do this for everybody. So I think we need to understand in their day, they would have been handling this body. They would have been dealing with this body. And for one that was to be in the temple ministering to the people of God, the Lord did not want his priests, those mediators, to be uh, limited and unable to come and to minister as a chief among his people. And so there was this limitation that was put upon him. It's not to say there was something sinful. It's to say, I've got a job for you, and I want you to be about the business of what I have called you to. For the one who set apart, um, we have fewer, um, there's fewer opportunities, there's fewer liberties that you will have. The more you get involved in serving and leading the, the, the more narrow your liberties come. I would say, and of course I'm speaking about within the body of Christ, but I would say that's even true in the secular world. Now, whether or not it's followed out or not, that's a different thing. But even in the secular world, leaders have, an, there's expectations that you place upon them. And so, you know, what may be free for somebody who... Um, is an entry-level employee for a, the CEO to do the same thing and be like, whoa, that doesn't quite seem right. And so we have this mentality that exists, but this is certainly within uh, the priesthood. There was going to, um, 
You know, they were going to have fewer um, uh, um, liberties that they could walk out. So for somebody in the tribe of Judah, they could do this all the time. All their friends, neighbors, you know, third cousins, it didn't matter. But for somebody that was going to be ministering, the Lord wanted him available for ministry. And so if he was to engage in this, he was going to be limited in the amount of time he could spend there in the temple. Verses 5 through 9, he's to be consecrated unto the Lord from other nations. And he's also to be consecrated in marriage in a way that the other men did not have to in the nation. They should not make any bald place on their heads, nor shall they shave the edges of their beards, nor make any cuttings in their flesh. They shall be holy to their God and not profane the name of their God, for they offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire, and the bread of their God, therefore they shall be holy. So don't mourn like the nations around you. Don't do what the other nations do. You shouldn't be grieving in that same way. And then he says in verse 7, They shall not take a wife who is a harlot or a defiled woman, nor shall they take a woman divorced from her husband, for the priest is holy to his God. Therefore you shall consecrate him, for he offers the bread of your God. He shall be holy to you, for I, the Lord who sanctify you, am holy. The daughter of any priest, if she profanes herself by playing the harlot, she profanes her father, she shall be burned with fire. So it was capital punishment for the daughter of a priest um, to go out in this way. And the idea is he's to be set apart and he is to be holy. Um, why is there these prohibitions in marriage? And I think part of it is going to have to do with just, um, again, he, the Lord says, I'm holy. He's to be holy. And so if there was anything that would, uh, that would come into that discussion about the previous um, life of that woman, then this could end up being a difficulty for him as he ministered. And so the Lord's like, um, you, th this is who you can you know, you could be with, but not, not with somebody who has been a harlot or somebody who has been divorced. Now, I can, I can, people, I can feel the, the blood pressure rising in, among some about this idea of divorce. But I want you to remember, it was God who gives a certificate of divorce to protect a woman who was being mistreated by a husband. It was God's compassion. He's the one that gave that. So it's not a lack of compassion. He fully understands that. But for the man that was going to be in the temple, it was a different standard. Verses 10 through 15, we come and we look at the high priest. And the demands on the high priest, they're even greater. He who was a high priest among his brethren, on whose head the anointing oil was poured in, and who is consecrated to wear the garments, shall not uncover his head nor tear his clothes. You can't mourn at all. Not only can you not mourn like the nations, you can't mourn even in a way that was culturally uh, normal. Nor shall he go near any dead body, nor defile himself for his father or his mother. Nor shall he go out of the sanctuary, nor profane the sanctuary of his God. For the consecration of the anointing oil of his God is upon him. I am Yahweh. This is for me. I'm asking this and I'm placing these limitations upon this one man that nobody else in the nation would have to deal with. But for this one man, he's going to be limited. And so um, that his ability to grieve was, um, it was limited even beyond what the other priests experienced. Now, in verse 13, it, the, the marriage window gets even more narrow. He shall take a wife in her virginity, a widow, or divorced woman, or defiled woman, or a harlot. These he shall not marry, but he shall take a virgin of his own people, so an Israelite, as wife. Nor shall he profane his posterity among his people, for I, the Lord, sanctify him. So it, it may be here, the reason there is this limitation is because... Um, there should be no question that the descendant of the priest, and especially the high priest, was actually one that was able to come and to take that. Because you had to be a descendant of Aaron. So if there was a blended family coming together and there was questions about that, then that one would not be able to have fulfilled this purpose. 
Um, let me just read to you a quote from uh, Glenn Martin uh, in his commentary on this. He says, She must be a virgin, which necessarily excluded a priest from marrying even a widow. Since both father and mother contributed to the rearing of a wholesome family, the priest was to take great care in choosing a suitable wife. Wenham notes that another reason for the above restriction might have been as a means of proving the high priest's children who often stood to succeed him in the office that they really belonged to him. So this would have been a practical place. Now the scripture does not say that. This is kind of like trying to reason. Why are some of these um, uh, limitations being placed there? Whatever the, all the reasons were for why God did this, we see that it was a very... It was more narrow for a priest or a high priest than it was for other people because they ministered before the Lord. Now, as you move into the New Testament, we may not have these same limitations that we read right here, but let's do get a little glimpse of what the New Testament has to say for those who stand and minister um, to the church in one of the offices of the church. 1 Timothy 3, verses 2 through 7. A bishop... Elder, you can think pastor. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Verse 6, not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So I think in principle you can see some of these same ideas begin to bubble up, as that the man is to be set apart. There is to be consecrated. And there is greater limitations placed upon those who would enter into uh, the full-time ministry position or just yeah, the, the office of elder or, or pastor or bishop than it would for others. Both the public life and the private life should be above reproach. They should not be, I should not be one man when I stand in front of you and another man when I am at home. And the world gets this. I mean, I think the church understands it, but even the unbelieving world understands um, this and they don't excuse it when a pastor fails. Now they may be living out the very thing that the pastor failed in, but because the man stands and calls people to live by the standard of the Word of God, when he does not do that, the world, although they may disagree with the biblical principle, will not give that man a pass. They will not give him a pass. And so I think it's something. That, um, that's why James said that he who teaches is going to be held in stricter judgment. Let me read to you. Um, this is by jo Joseph Seitz. And it's, it's, it's got probably six or seven sentences. But I think it, it just it struck me. I read it four or five times today and just contemplated it. Let me read. An unholy, unprincipled preacher must ever be an object of unmitigated contempt. He will be hissed and re reprobated to his very grave. And it is right that he should be. God has made it the first business of him who is a leader in holy things to see to it that he himself has submitted, him, submitted to the gospel which he asks others to obey. Not only the lynx eyes and the argus eyes of unconverted men are upon him to search and sift him, to magnify his deficiencies, drag forward his defects, and thus break his influence, but the all-seeing eye of Jehovah is upon him. And the hand of the heavenly master holds him over to the solemn judgment to act according to what he preaches. Like the high priest, he is the chief man among his people. And all their interests as well as his own demand that he should walk as becometh the gospel. And if withal he is inconsistent, dishonest, trifling, and faithless... It is but just the condemnation of heaven and earth. But it is but just that the condemnation of heaven and earth shall be upon him. A bishop must be blameless. Now, 
You may not like how far he goes with all of this, but I think what he does present is there's a standard by which God wants those who lead to be set apart. We're all set apart. We're all set apart. But for those who have that place of leadership, there is a greater requirement upon him. And, you know, for some, they can have the desire, and I would say maybe even the calling, to walk out this, but when they begin to feel those limitations, they begin to retreat. Like, I'm, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to have that. I don't want to limit myself. And it's like, well, is, it idea, is, it, is this really a biblical idea that you're limited? Yes, let me give you an example. Um, Paul fought, um, uh, you know, vigorously that a Gentile did not have to be circumcised in order to have a right standing with the Lord. And yet when he was calling his ministry partner, and most, who turns out to be his most trusted partner, Timothy, who was part Jewish and part Gentile, his parents were Jew and Gentile, um, he has him circumcised. And yet you read in Romans, you read in Galatians, and you see that he fights against those that would say you need to. But yet, Timothy, if you want to come and you want to be able to minister, we're not going to get caught up in this argument every time we go into a new town. So just go get circumcised and let's be done with it. And so Timothy did that. He was willing to put a limitation upon himself in order that he might have opportunity to step forward. Listen. This is something that can turn into a high level of legalism that nobody could, could meet the standard of. So we must be careful that we understand that there is a blameless call, but at the same time, there are things that could be put upon uh, certain individuals that nobody could ever live up to. And so there, there must be a balance. But that God calls those in ministry to have a narrower band of liberties is without question seen in Scripture. So, this is an important thing to consider. Before entering into ministry, it's an expectation you should have upon us who lead, um, is that we are living out what we are telling you to do. Uh, does that mean we're perfect? No, but if we settle into a lifestyle of disobedience, then that is where the line gets crossed. And that is no longer acceptable. In verses 16 through 24, we read some things that I think you're going to find a little difficult, maybe, if you've never read them before. And we're going to find that priests must be without physical deformity or ailment. So as I read this, I want you to think about some of my opening comments about the typology of Christ. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron, saying, No man of your descendants in succeeding generations who has any defect may approach to offer the bread of his God. For any man who has a defect shall not approach a man blind or lame or has a marred face or any limb too long, a man who has a broken foot or a broken hand, or as a hunchback or a dwarf, or a man who has a defect in his eye or eczema or a scab or is a eunuch. No man of the descendants of Aaron the priest who has a defect shall come near the offering made by fire to the Lord. He has a defect. He shall not come near to offer the bread of his God. He may eat the bread of his God. So you could be sustained by the ministry of the temple, both the most holy and the holy. Only he shall not go near the veil or approach the altar because he has a defect, lest he profane my sanctuaries for I the Lord sanctify them. And Moses told it to Aaron and his sons and to all the children of Israel. So there are about 12 physical disqualifiers. I don't know if we should think of that as being a, a, a you know, complete list, but there were 12 disqualifiers that would keep somebody from being able to serve that would have been in the lineage of being a priest, but because of these things could not. And we talked about these typologies. And when we think about Christ, not only was he a sinless sacrifice, but he was a completely capable high priest. It's something we've been talking about in Hebrews. So the typology is, not only is Jesus sinless, 
But he also is completely capable to f- perfectly fulfill that work of ministry. And I do believe that is why there is this limitation, is because this was all foreshadowing what was to come. But I, in saying this, in reading this, I want you to understand the emphasis as well that Scripture places upon the needy and the priority that they should have. A couple of chapters earlier here in book, the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, we see, saw that the Lord prohibited those that would treat the needy um, in an in a, uh, uncaring way. It says in Leviticus 19, 14, You shall not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shall fear your God. I am the Lord. I'm Yahweh. So don't mess with the needy people. Don't hurt them or harm them. When Job was pleading his innocence, he cited his care for the blind and the lame. Job 29.15, I was eyes to the blind and I was feet to the lame. Which is to say, I have lived a righteous life. Well, what does a righteous life look like? It looks like taking care of the needy. Israel was even judged. You can read in the prophets, read in the major prophets, um, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the minor prophets, and look and see how God brought national judgment upon the nation of Israel when they did not properly care for the needy. So the needy were close to the heart of the Lord. But what we have going on with the priests is a typology and a picture of our faithful high priest. So I'll read to you again a quote. It says, This demand for perfection of both priests and the offering was ultimately and uniquely fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ, who was a high priest, who as a high priest was not only unblemished and unstained, Hebrews 7.26, but as a sacrificial lamb was a sacrifice without defect, 1 Peter 1.19. So this is what's going on. This is not a larger statement about those that have limitations. God goes out of his way to say, you better take care of them. But if you're going to be in this place, this very narrow, only a handful of men would have done it. There was some specific limiters that were placed upon them. So you can wrestle through with this. And you may look and say, well, this doesn't seem like, you know, this is fair and this is right. But God is greater than all. And the picture that is being painted of Christ is clearly significant to the Lord. It is meaningful to him, and he wants us to see it clearly. Well, as you move into chapter 22, um, we continue to talk about the priest. Um, But as as we go into this section, we begin to read about the things that would defile the priest. Um, Verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, and they they separate themselves from the holy things of the children of Israel, and that they do not profane my holy name by what they dedicate to me. I am the Lord. Say to them, whoever of all your descendants throughout your generations who goes near the holy things which the children of Israel dedicate to the Lord, while he is unclean upon, uh, has uncleanness upon him, that person shall be cut off from my presence. I am the Lord. What, what's the point here? If you're going to go make a sacrifice for somebody who is unclean, and you as a priest are unclean yourself, what kind of hypocrisy is that? You're to be set apart. You should deal with the uncleanness before you would seek to offer. And so he is writing on this way to make certain that didn't take place. Um, and he gives, gets specific. Verse 4. Whatever man of the descendants of Aaron who is a leper or has a discharge shall not eat the holy offerings until he is clean. And whoever touches anything made unclean by a corpse or a man who has had an emission of semen or whoever touches any creeping thing by which he would be made unclean or any person by whom he would become unclean, whatever his uncleanness may be, The person who has touched any such thing shall be unclean until evening and shall not eat the holy offerings unless he washes his body with water. So the Lord is like, when you come before me, this is holy business. This is not casual. This is not like anything else you do in life. You are coming before me to make offerings and to worship me. And so there must be this awesome awareness of holiness, even when it seems a little painful to hear the limitations that God is putting there. 
That is the importance of holiness that the Lord is wanting them to see. In the book of Malachi, the Lord rebukes the priests because they treated the table of the Lord contemptible. They were doing the very things that God said they shouldn't do. Bringing the lame sacrifice, which we're going to read about in just a moment, and they themselves not having their hearts right. And so a whole book is written to rebuke the priesthood. Book of Malachi. In verses 10 through 13, those who were permitted to eat the food offered at the tabernacle are listed. So if, essentially, if you were in the house of a priest and he was financially responsible for you, you could eat. If you were in his house as a visitor, or if your daughter came home, but she has a husband who's not a priest, she couldn't eat that food anymore. So this was kind of a, you know, the idea. If you were financially responsible, then you were able to eat. But in verses 14 through 16, what happens if you wandered into your good buddy Levi, the priest's house? But you're from the tribe of Judah, but you guys have grown up together. And you're at the house. You feel so comfortable and casual in this house. And there's bread on the table, and you take and you eat it. But that was bread that was dedicated at the temple. Well, these verses say, if he unintentionally eats that bread, it's not a problem. He can simply um, pay a penalty, verse 14, of 20%. And, um, and you know, it will be all okay. Um, so this was it allowed for people who would unintentionally make a mistake of eating food that was dedicated just for the priest. But it also was costly so you wouldn't want to do this over and over again. And so you would be mindful the next time you went in to Levi's house and the bread is on the table. Like, Can I eat this bread? No, not this one. Eat this one. Okay, I don't want to do that again. So that, that's kind of what's going on here. But verses 17 through 25 begins to zero in on what is an acceptable sacrifice. And essentially what we read here is you can't bring an animal that had a defect, that had some kind of blemish upon it. That was an unacceptable sacrifice. If it had been, you know, got into a scrape with a wolf but escaped, you know, and has scabs and kind of tore up a bit, you can't offer that. If it was lame, you couldn't offer it. Uh, the animal had to be spotless. There had to be no inherent defect and no, no birth defect. And there could be no acquired defect. And so when it, that lamb was being offered up or whatever the animal was, it was representing that Jesus was a spotless, perfect sacrifice. So the same kind of a thought going on. You had to give the best you had in worship of the Lord. You couldn't give the cast off, the leftovers, and the things that you cared little about. There came a time in David's ministry, and I'm not going to get into the whole background, but there came a time when he was making a sacrifice, and somebody offered to give him um, everything for free for the sacrifice. In 2 Samuel 24, 24, he says, uh, he says, Nor will I offer a burnt offerings to the Lord my God, with that which costs me nothing. And so when David, not a Levite, but a king, and he says, when I come to worship the Lord, I don't want to bring something that doesn't, isn't valuable to me. I don't want to bring something that doesn't cost me. And I think we should be very careful as we consider our offerings of service and whatever it may be to the Lord, that we, we're not giving him the leftovers. We're not giving him the things that don't really matter to us anyway. It's like, hey, do you mind, you know, coming and helping out? You know what? I don't mind. I wasn't doing anything anyway. I was just sitting around. Um, I was kind of bored. Yeah, I'd be glad to come over and help. Well, I think that's a great thing. But what would be your response if you had things to do? What if it was going to cost you a rearrangement of your schedule to minister to the Lord in some way or to the body of Christ? Would you be of the same mentality? When we offer God second best, we're making a statement about him. And this is again takes us back into the book of Malachi. When the Lord says, hey, this lame sacrifice that's hobbling into the temple that you're wanting to offer that to me, why don't you take this mangy old lamb and go offer it to your governor? 
How is he going to view that offering? He's not going to like it. He's going to be disrespected. So when you come into my presence, don't bring the leftovers. Bring that which is of value. That which is beautiful. The best you have to offer to the Lord. I love this story that Pastor Chuck used to share of this farmer who had, um, he had this, this cow that was, was pregnant and she gave birth to twins and they were just both strong looking calves. And he comes into the house and he says, oh honey, the Lord has blessed us. Right, we have two twins, calves, and they are so strong. They are so healthy. This is wonderful. And I tell you, one is the Lord's and one is, is going to be ours. We're going to give one to the Lord. And she says, well, which one is it? He goes, oh, it doesn't matter. They're exactly the same. And so time went along. And as the weeks went along and the months went along, um, one of them ended up getting harmed and ended up dying. And he comes in the house. He goes, oh, honey, I got bad news. The Lord's calf died. You see, it's this idea that I'm not going to give the Lord the first. But, you know, what we are called and commanded to do is to give of the first fruits of our increase. The first fruits. We're going to give it off the top. We're going to give him the thing that, you know, in, in, in our economy of things, giving him, you know, that first offering off the top of what we have. It may, you know, we may think more in terms of like, you know, well, as long as it's the same amount, what difference does it make? But there's something when you give it off the top that you're just like, I'm acknowledging. Before my money goes to anything else, it goes to you. It goes to you. And so nothing else gets this before you get it, Lord. And it, it may end up being the same money if you were to give it last, but there's a heart mentality behind it that the Lord is very concerned about. So... Whatever you give to the Lord, make certain that you are giving the best you have. And it is not just some leftover. You know, don't rummage through your car, find the change and throw it at the Lord and expect him to be pleased with it. Now, listen, if all if what you have is that's it and that's what you're giving to the Lord, that's fine. But I'm not talking about that. We're talking about the idea that it's like it's an afterthought and it does not really matter to me. You know, I think we can easily develop this mentality. Well, the Lord wouldn't want me to make a sacrifice to give to him. And yet you couldn't spend a second in the temple without something dying and being sacrificed all day long, every day. And yet we have this idea, well, I don't want to, you know, and this is going to be really hard. I don't think the Lord would have me to do something that's going to be hard. Oh, I think he does. I think he does. Because remember what he says, if you want to follow me, why don't you take up your cross and deny yourself? You know, so Jesus said, if you want to follow me, I'm not sure you do want to follow me. Do you really want to follow me? I really want to follow you. If you want to follow me, they're going to put you to death because you follow me. Are you sure you still want to follow me? So the Lord is not afraid to ask for everything from us. So I would just encourage you as a takeaway from this, evaluate how you give to the Lord in every aspect of how you give and say, is this, is this a, a generous gift that comes from my heart and it's an overflow of my thanksgiving? Or am I just offering him those things don't, that really don't cost me anyway? Am I putting him first in my giving? So as they brought the sacrifices, they had to be acceptable, perfect sacrifices. Verses 26 through 30. And I've just kind of labeled this section, be mindful and zealous. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, when a bull or sheep or a goat is born, it shall be seven days with its mother. And from the eighth day and thereafter, it shall be accepted as an offering made by fire to the Lord. Whether it is a cow or a ewe, do not kill both her and her young on the same day. So, he says, there's just, just something, be mindful. This isn't appropriate that on the day that a, a, something would be born that you'd be putting it to death. And don't put them to death at the same time. So some, you know, a, a reverence for the lineage and for, um, you know, the new birth. So they were to be mindful in this way. Now look at verse 29. And when you offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving to the Lord, offer it. Of your own free will. So don't be under obligation. 
On the same day it shall be eaten. You shall leave none of it until morning. I am the Lord. So some of the sacrifices, remember, that you would bring to the Lord, um, you would offer it up, and part would go to the Lord, but some of the sacrifices, you would take a part home with you. But when you got it home, don't wrap it up in, you know, tin foil and stick it in the fridge and say, I'm not really hungry anyway, I'll get to it in a couple of days. You know, as I ponder that, I'm like, so what would be the big deal? And I think the idea is simply this. I've been in the house of the Lord, and I offered him something. I should, and the picture is that of communion. As the picture is that of, of, of the Lord took this part, and I received this part. And as I eat the, this, it's a, it's a portion of the same thing that was given to the Lord, and it was a picture of fellowship with, the God, with God. And so to just leave it to sit is to show a lack of concern or zeal for that communion and that worship and that connection that you had just had with the Lord. And I, I, I convicted in this. Because we should have a zeal to meet with the Lord at all times. A zeal to go and commune with Him. I mean, for them, they got to bring something home. And they got to eat with it. But this didn't happen every day. It was a special occasion. And yet for us, we are given so much more because we are able to meet and fellowship with the Lord and go behind the veil of communion. And how often we let it just sit in the refrigerator in the back. I'll get to it. I'll partake later, Lord. I've got other things to do. And he would say to us, can you be a little excited to eat with me? Can you be a little excited to sit down and have a meal with me? And so the Lord is calling them to be zealous, I would say. Verses 31 through 33, last couple of verses of chapter uh, 22. We obey because God is holy. Therefore, you shall keep my commandments and perform them. I am Yahweh. Why all these rules and all these reasons to obey? Because God is God. Because he has a right. He is the covenant. He's the one with whom we have a covenant. And so if he calls us to something, we should do that. Now that applied to them in all these very specific details. But this applies to us and living out holy lives as well. Verse 32, you shall not profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. He is our God. He is holy and he has delivered us. Those are three really good reasons why we should be um, walking in holiness. He is our God. He is holy and he has redeemed us. There's your motivation for walking out holiness. Well, in chapter 23... We have seven different um, uh, feasts, celebrations on the calendar for the nation of Israel. In verses 1 through 3, he emphasizes and talks about the Sabbath day rest. We've, we've dealt with this quite a bit in the book of Exodus, so I'm not going to rehearse this again. Um, but it was a sign of the Mosaic covenant, and they were to keep the Sabbath day a holy. They were to set apart. They were to rest on that day. Uh, no specified day like that in the New Testament, um, but there is a day in which we see the early church gathering for their meetings, and it was Sunday, and that's why we meet on Sunday. Um, but uh, we get instruction in, in the scripture that um, we should not argue about these days. Jesus is a fulfillment of them all. So I realize that probably is something that some of you like me to dig into more. But just for the sake of time, I encourage you to go back and, and listen to some of those other studies. But of these feasts that we're about to look at, they're commemorative. They looked back at things that God had done in their midst. But they also were predictive and that they looked forward to the things that Jesus was going to fulfill. And so we will see as we go through. We begin in verses 4 and 5 with the Passover. It says, these are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. On the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. This commemorated the event that took place in Exodus chapter 12 when God 
um, instructed them to take the blood of the lamb and put it over the doorpost and lintel of their house. And wherever that blood was, as death went throughout the land of Egypt, that tenth plague against them, whoever was under the house where that blood was, death passed over. And no harm came to those people. So they were to remember this um, and spend um, year by year to take and to share in a Passover meal. Now, 1 Corinthians 5, 7 tells us, Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are truly unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. So Jesus becomes the fulfillment of that. Jesus becomes that lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. And if we are in Christ, if we received his sacrifice for our sins, then his blood is over our life, and we do not have to worry about eternal judgment. Death will pass over us because we have Christ as our Passover. So these looked back at what God had done in their history at the time of the Exodus, but they were also looking forward to what Jesus was going to do for um, Israel and the world by coming as a lamb and suffering and dying. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So we become new in Christ. But this was also, um, if you read in Exodus 12, 1 and 2, this was the beginning of their year. So Passover was a, it marked the beginning of the year for them. And just as he is our Passover and we are in Christ, it's a new beginning. When we come to him, all of the past is taken away and was forgiven and it's under the blood of the Lamb. And so it's just a picture of Christ. Um, in conjunction with the Passover was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So they ran together for eight days. Passover was one. And then you had seven days of the unleavened bread. So it was like an eight-day vacation. So we read in verse 6, And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. So you couldn't have anything where you used yeast and it would have caused that, that uh, dough to rise. It all had to be unleavened. On the first day you shall make a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. But you shall... Offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. The seventh day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. So the picture here is that leaven is a type of sin. Uh, Paul will say a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. And he's referring to sin. So for them to take all the leaven out was a reminder that they should be holy and they should be set apart. Again, 1 Corinthians 5 Verse 7 says, Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are truly unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So, of course, Jesus was without any sin. But now this becomes a picture. This, this feast of unleavened bread was a picture of how we are to be set apart. First came the Passover, right? There, you know, and, and being cleansed. And now we live a set-apart life. So they're looking back, but it's also looking forward. Um, verses 9 through 14 is the Feast of first fruits. Um, this would be a feast that would have uh, been celebrated um, after, um, right after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So this would have, they, they just, you know, was kind of ran together, these different, these three feasts. And this was a, a time where they would bring in um, a harvest of the first fruits, and they would bring them to the Lord, and a priest would take them, and he'd wave them before the Lord. It was to say, thank you for this harvest. We've planted, you've sent the water, you've kept the pests away, and now we've harvested. It's the first part of the harvest, but thank you, Lord, we worship you. And so they would do this. But this was Resurrection Sunday morning when this feast was going on. So when Jesus was rising from the dead, the first one to rise from the dead, never to die again, there was a first fruits offering of the first harvest uh, from the grain that was being offered up in the temple. 
And so Jesus becomes that first fruit of those who have eternal life. 1 Corinthians 15.20 says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ that is coming. So Jesus rose from the dead. That, that's why you can have hope and why I can have hope. And every generation of the church had hope that there's going to be a resurrection. I'm going to spend eternity with Jesus. And it brings us comfort when we, we uh, uh, put those we love to rest in Christ. We're like, well, they're in the presence of the Lord because we believe in this eternal life. But he was the first one to rise from the dead Never to die again. Other people rose from the dead, but they always died again. But Jesus was the first one to rise from the dead, never to die again, and became the hope we have of everlasting life. Jesus in John chapter 12, right before he was to go to the cross, verses 23 and 24, he said, The hour has come that the Son of Man shall be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Jesus was a grain of wheat that was laid into that tomb. And when it came into harvest, he came out at the same time in which the, the Feast of first fruits was being offered up. And, of course, he was the first of many that have put their faith and trust and have the hope of eternal life. So, I mean, this is amazing, isn't it? It's really amazing that thousands of years ahead of time, the Lord is painting this calendar out. And he's putting things into place. Now they're looking back at certain events, the harvest they just experienced. They're looking at living a holy life and unleavened bread that they ate at the time of the Exodus. They're looking at the Passover lamb that was over their homes. And they're looking back. This is what God did in our history. But the whole time God is looking forward to how it ultimately was going to be fulfilled in the Lord, and indeed it was. Now in verses 15 through 22, um, there's a little bit of time between this feast and the other three that just ran um, one after another. And this is a feast of Pentecost. It comes some 50 days after Passover. So uh, some time elapses. And again, this was another um, time to celebrate um, uh, the barley harvest that was taking place. The first one was the wheat harvest. So that now a little bit later came the barley harvest. And again, they were coming to say thank you to the Lord. Let's read beginning at verse 15. And you should count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, so not after Passover, but the end of uh, unleavened bread, just to correct myself there, then you shall offer a, a new grain offering to the Lord. So that's the sacrifice, a new grain offering. You shall bring from your dwellings two uh, wave loaves of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be a fine flour, and they shall be baked with what? Leaven. The other ones had to be unleavened for a week, but this one is going to have leaven in it. They're the first fruits to the Lord. And you shall offer with bread seven lambs of the first year without blemish, one young bull, two rams. They shall be as a burnt offering to the Lord with their grain and their drink offering, an offering made by fire for a sweet aroma to the Lord. Then you shall sacrifice one of the kids. So let me just go through it. Everything they're supposed to do, all the offerings that they are to, uh, to bring. In verse 22, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field when you reap, nor shall you gather any gleanings from your harvest, you shall leave them for the poor, for the stranger. I am the Lord your God. On this day is the day the church began in Acts chapter 2. So when you read in Acts chapter 2, it says when the, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, there was gathered in the upper room 120. And while they were there, um, in the presence of the Lord, the Lord poured out his Holy Spirit upon them. They had tongues of fire over them. They began to speak in tongues and began to prophesy. And the church of Jesus Christ began on the day of Pentecost. And there were 3,000 souls that were added 
to the church, quite a harvest. And so these first four of the seven feasts were all fulfilled, have all been fulfilled, I should say, in both the sacrifice and atonement of Christ and in the beginning of the church. So this is a significant day for us. But it is interesting that there is leaven. And um, doesn't say specifically, but you have to wonder if this is not the idea of the Jew and the Gentile both being coming together in one body. And so there's this mixture that is taking place. And now there's the one new man um, in the church. Um, just if you want to think about this, the Jews read the book of Ruth during this feast. That's their tradition. It's a, a time, it makes sense, it's a harvest scene in the book of Ruth. Then you have the Feast of Trumpets in verses 23 through 25. And it says, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel, saying in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial, a blowing trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. The one neat thing about all of these feasts was you got a day off. You got a break. It was vacation time that the Lord built in. Now, as you look at this, uh, we have little information really about this feast other than it was a trumpet blowing ceremony. And um, w we wonder, we don't know for certain, but you can just write it down as a question. And at the second coming of Christ, ask this question, is he coming back on the Feast of Trumpets? Because in Matthew 24, verse 29 through 31, we read, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds uh, of heaven with power and great glory. He will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now we, don't, we can't say for certain. But it would not surprise me at all if the second coming of Christ comes in this season. The next day, a day we've been talking about a lot on Sunday morning, is the Day of Atonement. Here in verses 26 through 32, it's when they, the priest goes in to the temple and to the Holy of Holies, and only one man, the high priest, one day out of the year, as laid out here in verses 26 through 32, would go in and he would make an offering for the nation for their sin. And um, so this was a significant day for them. And um, it was a day for them to reflect. It was a day for them to consider how they were living their life. Um, you know, Leviticus 16 actually is a companion passage to this. And you want to uh, probably take a look at this. Again, is this going to be fulfilled at some day in the future? I, I would think so. Uh, Zechariah 12, 10, and 11, and then Zechariah 13 speaks about this cleansing and this mourning that's going on. And that's what this day was to be about. Verse 29 of Leviticus says, For any person who is not afflicted in soul on the same day shall be cut off from his people. So this idea that you're really to be just broken, and yet when you read in Zechariah 12, 10, and 11, it talks about the mourning that's going on in the nation as they realize it's the, the, the Lord. So who knows how all of these are going to be fulfilled in the future. There's a Feast of Tabernacles, in verses 33 through 44, this is when um, they would celebrate and remember the wilderness wanderings. They would set up lean-tos with palm branches. They would camp outside, and they would look up into the stars and remember how for 40 years their forefathers wandered in the wilderness. But yet God took care of them and um, watched over them um, while they were there. And it was a way to look back and say, hey, God's going to take care of us. Some see this as maybe being fulfilled as the millennial kingdom is ushered in. And finally, the, 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 you know, the wandering that Israel spiritually has been gone, going through is, um, comes to an end. Um, so you have these seven feasts that are on Israel's calendar. 
Obviously, I went through them briefly. There's a lot more you can take a look at. Hopefully, I gave you enough to wet your whistle and go and, and study and to contemplate. But three main points here for us to close with. Living a set apart, uh, a life that's set apart, will feel and look different than the world around us. But it's a privilege to be servants of the King. And so when he calls us to be holy, we should not look upon this and think, oh man, all these limitations. We should look and say, Lord, you are worthy. You are my Lord. You are my God. And I am happy to have you specifically ask me to do something that is for your glory and honor. Let us resolve to be those who give generously and never offer the Lord the leftovers of our life. And lastly, be amazed at the wonder of God's calendar for the nation of Israel. Look and see how the word of God so perfectly fits together. Jesus said that the word of God, the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, that they are all about him. And when you go through the law, as we are, and you read about the, the, even the calendar, you're like, like, he fulfilled every aspect of that. How could that be anything other than God dwelling outside of time, writing this down and putting it together and, and just watching how it so beautifully comes together and that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of these things. Very much connects with the book of Hebrews that we're studying. So the Lord is going to return and we'll get to evaluate and see how and if these other feasts are fulfilled at his second coming in the same way that they were fulfilled at his first coming. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and your truth. We do want to live a life that's set apart. Lord, may we never be those that grumble about being consecrated, holy people. But Lord, may we see the privilege you've placed upon us to be a light in this world, to be your servants, to be that priesthood under the new covenant. Lord, may we be those that understand you've given us all things and that in return we give back generously and joyfully, not begrudgingly, but with just an overflow of thanksgiving. And Lord, we thank you that we have your word to not only see what was written in the past, but how your word so perfectly fulfills not just the specific prophecies, but even those types, even days on a calendar, Lord, you were putting it all together. May our hearts, Lord, overflow with an appreciation for your word and how you are so organized and you are such an, a God of order. And Lord, we know you're going to come back and you're going to fulfill the promises you've made to us. Lord, give us a heart to wait patiently for you. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen.